We have asked Michael Kaiser to talk to us today about what he has learned through his 50 state listening tour about the arts at this time of crisis. He will only scratch the surface of this topic because we have limited him to about a half hour. He could talk for much longer. After he talks with us, there will be a small panel of local art, Chicago arts leaders sitting here in these beautiful white leather chairs, commenting on his findings, asking questions, and pushing back on what Michael has said if they disagree. He's invited that and we will accommodate, I know. <laughs> then we will open the floor up for your questions and comments, okay? So today it is a real honor for me to introduce Michael Kaiser. I remember clearly the day I became a Michael Kaiser fan. He was at our office at MacArthur seeking funding for a program to build the capacity of culturally specific arts organizations in the Midwest. As we went through our foundation process, taking advantage of the expert, his expertise to learn from him and asking all the smart and probing questions we could think of, I wondered, why is he doing this? After all, he's president of the Kennedy Center. He has a huge string of accomplishments. He ran his own successful management consulting firm before deciding to work in the arts. He served as general manager of the Kansas City Ballet, which was on the brink of bankruptcy when he became its general manager in 1985, and two years later, it was able to pay off the deficit that almost led to its closing. He joined the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater as executive director in 1991. The company faced extreme challenges stemming from a million and a half dollar accumulated deficit. Kaiser developed a strategic plan with the company's board and staff, targeted fundraising and marketing as key areas for overhaul. And during his tenure there, the company eliminated its deficit, increased the efficiency of its touring programs, and it enhanced its national and international image. He became the director of the American Ballet Theater in 1995. Again, going to a company that had a huge deficit, in this case 5.5 million, if my data is correct. Uh, ticket revenues were not sufficient to meet the company's needs, and the debt had reduced the board, management, and staff to a daily struggle to keep afloat. But within three years, the company had eliminated the accumulated deficit and established a surplus. After a success at the American Ballet Theater, the Chicago Tribune coined the term the turnaround king for Kaiser. In 1998, he assumed leadership of the Royal Opera House in London, home of the Royal Opera London and the Royal Ballet. In the midst of a major re renovation, it was faced with a projected $30 million deficit. So you see the stakes are getting higher. <laughs> <laughs> and it was getting a firestorm of criticism from the public, board, and patrons. Within two years, the deficit was paid off, the new building paid for and opened, and an endowment fund established to protect the security of the organization's future. So then he joined the Kennedy Center as president in 2001, and I don't think there was any huge bailout <laughs> needed there. Uh, and so he was able to concentrate on artistic work, but he, that wasn't all he did. He, um, at the Kennedy Center, he established the Kennedy Center Arts Management Institute to help all of those um, those leaders of arts organizations around the country that he cared so, about, uh, cared so much about. So what was he doing in the MacArthur Foundation asking for support for a Midwest arts management capacity building program? I had to ask, and he told me. He said that he loves arts organizations, and he is on a mission at home and abroad to improve how well arts organizations are managed. He works with troubled groups that are large and small, urban and rural, throughout the country so that artists can fulfill their dreams, and this benefits us all. Along with our funding par partners, the Boeing Corporation and the Joyce Foundation, we've been delighted to have the Kennedy Center in Chicago for the last year, helping to strengthen some of Chicago's key arts organizations. And I am delighted to welcome Michael Kaiser here today to help us all understand better what we need to do to ensure the success of these vitally important organizations. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. It's a, is my mic working? You can hear great. It's great to be here today. I'm so honored to have been invited to talk about my tour, which I finished on July 20th in Boise, Idaho. I went to 69 cities in all 50 states, plus um, Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia, talking with arts managers, artists, and board members 
about how to handle the economic crisis. The best news and most important news of the tour was that in every state, in every city I visited, and I visited cities big and small, there is a tremendous passion and excitement and interest in the arts. That excitement has not been dampened by the recession. People drove for hours and hours to come to the sessions, particularly in states, more rural states, like the Dakotas, like Wyoming, where there has been very little opportunity for board members and staff members to discuss these topics. In South Dakota, we were in Pierre, South Dakota, a city of 13,000 people, and 100 people showed up, driving sometimes six hours to come to the session. It was really quite moving for me to see that, pet, that dedication, that passion for the arts. Um, living on the East Coast, I sometimes see myself and my peers being a little bit um, obnoxiously thinking that the only good art is on the coast, the only passionate people out the arts are on the coast. It's absolutely not true. There's tremendous excitement and interest everywhere. But there's also tremendous concern and fear and anxiety, and in some cases anger, in almost every city I visited. And I think a lot of it stems from the fact that there's such a disagreement over what makes arts organizations successful. And so many board members, staff members, artists, really f had very different points of view about what makes an arts organization successful. And I thought I would just take two minutes out and talk about what I think makes an arts organization successful, because it really informs a lot of the observations I made on my tour. And, and for me, it's extremely simple. What makes arts organizations successful is good art. And you know, to me, that seems so self, so it's just so true. How, how could that be wrong? And yet, it's astonishing how many people I met around this country who don't believe that what makes an arts organization successful is good art. But for me, it's art. And I use the word art really to mean all programming. So those of you who do um, are mostly educational organizations, those of you who are mostly um, outreach organizations, all of that falls to me within the word art. But it's simpler to write art. Um, but for me, if you do really, really great art, and then if you communicate that art really well through your marketing, then what you do is you build what I call your organizational family. And your family are the people from the outside who help you. They're your board, they're your donors, they're your ticket buyers, the people who come to your classes, your volunteers, all the people who really help us. To me, that's what I call my family. My family is only excited and growing if I'm doing really good work and communicating it well. If I'm doing those two things well, and if my family is happy and growing, then they do something wonderful, which is to provide me with money. And if I take that money, and only if I take that money and put it back into more wonderful art and market it well, and the family gets larger and even happier and produces more money, which I put into more art and market really well, and my family's even happier. This cycle, this happy cycle, is to me what is characteristic of a successful arts organization. And why I did my tour was because I was reading article after article after September of 2008, after um, the big crash on Wall Street. So many arts organizations, first response to the economic crisis was to cut their art, to do less, less interesting work, less work. And when you do less art, you almost always do less marketing, too. And when you do less art and you do less marketing, your family starts looking elsewhere. And they start looking for another organization that's doing more interesting work. And they leave you. Or the family you have left gets a little less interested. And when they get a little less interested, you have less money. And when you have less money and you cut your art even more and your marketing even more and your family gets even more bored and you lose even more money and you get on this horrible, vicious cycle that to me is why so many arts organizations are so weak today. And I used to run American Ballet Theater, as Elsbeth said. American Ballet Theater, when I got to it, was in deep financial problems. And to combat that problem, they had done the exact same ballet, Romeo and Juliet, for seven years in a row. They did it because it was cheap. 
They did it because it was rehearsed, and they had the sets, and they had the costumes. So why not do it again and again and again? Well, if your art's boring, your family's bored. They lost their family. When I got there, there was no one left. And this, to me, is the central, central thing that I learned on this tour, which is too quickly do we, and i be honest, many oftentimes pushed by our boards, too often do we start to respond to a fiscal crisis by saying, let's do less. Let's not be so interesting. Let's do safe work this year. I've seen the creativity beaten out of much of our field because people are so frightened about money that they're frightened to take risk with the art. And to me, this is a very, very sad and problematic um, issue that, we, that many of us and many arts organizations face in this country. For me, the antidote to this, particularly if you're frightened, is to do long-term artistic planning. I find too many arts organizations plan their art six months, eight months, a year, 18 months in advance. And for me, the key, particularly if you're scared, and by the way, particularly if you're small, is to say, what dreams can I make true? What have I always wanted to express? And I'm only going to do that four and five years from now. But I'm going to take four or five years to get there. And I am a huge advocate for long-term artistic planning because I believe that arts organizations that do the longer-term planning have more time to find the resources to make the art wonderful, to do the marketing, to make this transformational projects that get the family so excited. And so one of the things I learned on this tour was how many organizations in the recession were actually planning less far in advance. They were saying, we don't know what the world will be like in five years, so we're not going to have any dreams about five years from now. And my feeling is if you only try and plan your art six or eight months or 12 months in advance, you're always going to do the same kind of art, the same size art, because you're never going to have the resources to do something bigger and more expansive. And to me, that's a very, very big problem. The second thing I saw was that a lot of arts organizations really don't understand what it means to do marketing. And I break marketing into two pieces. One piece I call programmatic marketing. And that's the marketing we all think of when we think of marketing in the arts world. Programmatic marketing is the things we do to get people to buy tickets, come to our exhibitions, or our classes. It's the advertising, the email blasts, the websites, the posters, et cetera, that we do. And to be honest, I find a lot of arts organizations do programmatic marketing reasonably well around this country. But I did see, as I traveled around, one big problem, which is that arts organizations have been too slow to adopt the online social networking opportunities that we have that really can help us to build our visibility in a very, very inexpensive way. There's a reason why newspapers are going bankrupt. It's because people aren't reading them as much anymore, the hard copy. People are online much more. 50% of the people that joined Facebook in the last six months are over the age of 50. I'm one of them. <laughs> and, and I know how much time I'm spending online, and I know how inexpensive it is for me to create real visibility, and particularly for the harder to sell projects. You know, I like to differentiate when I sell a project whether it's something that's easy to sell, like Nutcracker, or like Placido Domingo coming to give a recital, for something that's much more challenging, a new work by a new author with artists who people have not heard of before. And we need much more information when we're trying to sell that latter category of art. And, the, and online gives us an opportunity to give so much information through videos, through audios, through bios, et cetera, that we can really create a lot of knowledge, and we can teach a lot of people before they come to something at almost no cost to ourselves. But so programmatic marketing is one area where I think we can improve ourselves and actually lower our costs, frankly, by using online activities more. But I'm most interested about something that I call institutional marketing. It's the topic that's really interested in me most in my whole career. So that's a book. I'm writing the book right now. I started working on it yesterday, actually, on institutional marketing, because I love this topic. And what institutional marketing is, it's the work we do to get people thinking we are the most exciting organization in town. It starts, the heart of our institutional marketing is our art, the work we do, the exciting, big, wonderful work we do. 
But then there are other things we can do. And I'll give a very brief example from one organization I ran, the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, and what we did there to create this institutional image. When I got to Alvin Ailey in 1991, the company was virtually bankrupt. And we were all sort of shocked. How could it be so bankrupt? You know, we're Alvin Ailey. We travel everywhere. Everyone knows who we are. And then shortly after I arrived, the author Alex Haley died. The, you know Alex Haley is the author of the book Roots. And we got thousands of letters of condolence because people thought that Alex Haley was Alvin Ailey. And <laughs> that told me that we were not so famous. <laughs> and we thought we were. We thought we were, but we really weren't. And I think we tend to overestimate how famous we are. And so, so what did we do to, to make it clear that we did not write Roots? Um, and I'm going to give you very briefly what we did. And it's not because I want you to follow exactly. And some of you say, my organization can't do that exactly. I want you to get a sense of the kinds of things we did. We got on the Phil Donahue show. For the young people in the room, he was the person before Oprah. Um, <laughs> That was in December of 92. In January of 93 was President Clinton's first inauguration. And I found out through a board member there was going to be a big gala the night before with Michael Jackson and Barbara Streisand and Fleetwood Mac and Aretha Franklin. And I asked this board member, well, how do I get, how do I get on that gala? And he said, well, it's going to be hard. He said, but the person running the inauguration is this man named Rahm Emanuel. So call him up. <laughs> and so I called up Rahm Emanuel. And we eventually got on the show. And 88 million people saw that TV show. Two months later, we did a big exhibition about the history of the Ailey organization at the Smithsonian Institution. And in July of that year, we did a big free concert in Central Park. And thousands of people came. And we also, CNN covered it and ran a little section every half hour for, 40, for 24 hours, so 48 times. And then the next month, August of 93, Mayor Giuliani, the mayor of New York at the time, named our street Alvin Ailey Place. And there was press about that. And in November of that year, two books were published about the company. And in December of that year, exactly a year after Donahue, was our 35th anniversary season in New York. And we opened with a big gala with Jesse Norman and Al Jarreau and Dionne Warwick and Denzel Washington and Maya Angelou. Everywhere you turned around for 12 months, there was the Ailey organization. The year before we did this, 1992, we raised $1.7 million. 1993. When we were doing all this, we raised $3.4 million. We doubled our fundraising and paid off the entire deficit in the one year. Why? Because our family got so much bigger and so much happier. Part of that family is our board. And my board, when I went to Alvin Ailey and I said, who do you know? I have 36 board members. I went to each of them individually, saying, we're about to go bankrupt. Who do you know who can help us? And the astonishing thing was not one of my board members had ever met another human being. <laughs> I know none of you have experienced that. <laughs> and then, two years later, after we're doing all this institutional marketing, all of a sudden, my board wanted, had they made thousands of friends who they wanted to bring into the Ailey organization. <laughs> By the way, none of this institutional marketing cost us a penny. That's really important. It took a lot of time. But the Donahue Show paid for the Donahue Show. The inauguration paid for the inauguration. The Smithsonian paid for the exhibition, et cetera. We didn't pay any of this. But it took a lot of time, a lot of creativity to make that whole system work. And I believe that this is something in my tour, what I learned was that most arts organizations, if they're doing institutional marketing, it's by accident. And I have a marketing plan, an institutional marketing plan for my organization. I'm worried about what is the thing we're going to do next and next and next and next. And I find a lot of arts organizations said, well, we had a big story in the newspaper. That should be enough. It's not enough. We live in a very media-dense world. There's so much information out there. And so to me, institutional marketing was a very, very, very important part of what I observed is not happening in the arts ecology. And I believe this is something that is, from, in my experience, the difference between sickness and health for so many organizations. Because so many organizations, when they tell me they're having problems, the first thing they jump to is fundraising. But for me, fundraising results from a happy family. And a happy family results from really interesting art and really strong marketing. That's when you can do fundraising. If you just go out there and say, we're going to fundraise more and harder and harder and harder, it's brute force fundraising. It doesn't work. You hit your limits. What gets money, people giving money is when they're really excited, when this family's getting bigger and bigger. 
And it isn't how charming your fundraiser is. It's not how good the flowers are on the gala. It's not the color of the invitation that makes people give you money. What makes people give you money is when they're really excited about who you are. And that comes from these two things. So when you cut these two things, you cut your ability to raise money. The last major thing I learned on my tour was how frustrated board members are and how scared board members are and how much of a schism exists in so many organizations between the staff and the artists and the board. And I found that, that board members around the country didn't really, really, really believe in this model and frankly, in a lot of cases, didn't really believe in the mission of the organization and the mission is, of course, what determines what our programming is going to be. I found a lot of board members who really say, oh, yeah, we have our mission, but what we really believe in is we have to break even. That's our mission. <laughs> and I said, well, if you think that's the mission, then close the organization and go home, because then you've achieved your mission. You've broken even. Um, and, and I really think that, and I studied why is this true, and why do so many board members around the United States not truly believe the mission? And I believe it's our fault as managers. I believe our board meetings are too focused on money. We use our board meetings to whine. We, we say we don't have cash flow, we don't have cash flow, we can't play the vendors, we can't play the staff, what are we gonna do about it? And, and I'm sure none of you have ever experienced that. But, but I find that's true in other cities besides Chicago. Um, <laughs> And, and what, I, what I really do believe is that we have to really get everyone in the institution truly believing in our mission. And I see so many namby-pamby mission statements. Our mission is to bring the beauty of dance to the world. You know, that's not a mission. That's sort of like this goal that's so, so unclear that it doesn't really direct the efforts of the organization. And I believe in the not-for-profit world, we have to be especially clear about our mission because we're so different from the for-profit world, as, as we heard before from Hal. In the for-profit world, it's easy. The words are, it's in the words, for-profit. That's the mission, hmm? For-profit. In the not-for-profit world, we only know what we're not, we're not for. It's true. It's not a joke, but it's true. What are we for? What is our organization really for? We've got to be so clear and clean about that and so that we can create the programming that really is in service to the mission. Because what I saw all across the United States is what I call mission drift. A foundation offers you a grant to do something that's not really in your mission. You take the money because you get a little piece for overhead. And all of a sudden, you do enough of that over a 10-year period, and now no one knows what your mission is anymore. And when your mission's unclear, your art won't be clear. When your art won't be clear, your marketing can't be clear. And when these aren't clear, your family's not clear what you're about. And we've done this to ourselves, and we've created boards who are not really fully invested in the missions of our organizations. And we need to revisit the mission with our board, we need to get them excited, and then we need to get our boards involved. And another thing that I saw was that, and I asked people, I said, how do you do how do you do your board meetings and how, how do you involve your board members? And I would always hear them talk about the board, the board, the board. And what I, what I have come to believe is that boards are really a group of individuals. They're volunteers. And our job is to get these volunteers excited and engaged in our work. And we don't do this by t trying to get board members generally interested in who we are, I don't believe. What I have found works better is to try and get each board member to figure out one project we're planning that they're excited about. It can be an artistic project, it can be a fundraising event, it can be fixing the building, whatever, one thing that gets that one board member excited. And if we do a good job of getting a board member excited about a project and letting them get involved in that project. They don't run it, they just get involved and they learn about it and they get excited about it and they become the champion for that project. And then the next board member has another project that they get excited about and they get involved with and they become the champion for that one. And the next board member, the next, pretty soon you now have a board who's involved in so much of your work. They really now are buying into your true mission 
And believe me, they start to involve their friends and associates in that project because they're excited and proud about it. And now all of a sudden you have a board that's fundraising without even feeling like they're fundraising because they're so excited that their project's happening next February and they want their friends to be involved in it. I think we don't do a good enough job of getting board members involved. We sort of just say at meetings, you better go help fundraise, you better go help fundraise, and that's not good enough. So for me, those are the three key things that I found on my tour. Number one, we're not planning our art well in advance, in advance which means we can't do the exciting art we need to do to excite our, our base. We really need to do really interesting, important art. Plan it years in advance. Do joint ventures if you can't find the money to do it yourself. And if this year you can't do the most exciting project because you're having financial problems, announce a great project three years from now. I did that at ABT. When I told you we did Romeo and Juliet seven years in a row, we, we announced the month I got there a new full-length ballet, new score, new costumes, new everything based on Shakespeare's Othello. And we had three years to make it happen. And in those three years, we found a joint venture partner, the San Francisco Ballet. We got people excited. We seemed vibrant again. People don't care when the art's going to happen. They just want to know that it's going to happen. So plan your art really well in advance and make it exciting. Do really good, both programmatic and institutional marketing. Be welcoming of new people into the family. So many people today are holding on for dear life to the family members they have and not welcoming others in. And when one does that, the money comes. And then, very importantly, don't take that money and spend it on new office furniture. And don't take that money and build a building you can't afford, or don't take that money and say, we need an endowment fund because everyone tells me we need an endowment fund. Take that money and put it into more great programming and start the cycle functioning. If we do that, then arts organizations will be a lot happier. And, 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 and lastly, and I'm so glad I'm getting to give this, this discussion here in this institution, which is dedicated to training not-for-profit leaders, is I, just have to, I can't leave without saying my hot button, which I also saw on my tour, in every community was spending, including the, the smallest communities, Meridian, Mississippi, Billings, Montana that I was in, spending so much money, millions and even billions of dollars training singers and dancers and actors and choreographers and almost nothing to train the people who have to employ them. And if we, as a field, don't start to train more people who, to understand what makes success and then understand much more how does each of these boxes work and how do we make it work, then we're not going to allow our artists to really fulfill the visions and the dreams that they have, which is, after all, our goal. I shouldn't have my job at the Kennedy Center. I've not had one day of training for my work. No one's ever taught me. I've had no, no formal training. That's not a good thing. And, and I, I'm hopeful that over the next 10 and 20 years, we can really start to change that. I thank you very much for this opportunity to talk with you. That's what I learned in my tour. And I'll turn the microphone over to Elspeth. Thanks so much. If I could ask the panel to come up on the stage. Um, Michael, I wish we'd asked you to speak for twice as long. <laughs> I could have listened for a lot longer. But hopefully some of the things we might want to talk about more will come out through the panel. And also, please start to think about questions that you might have uh, in the audience. Come sit over here. <clears throat> so our, our uh, panelists are local arts leaders. Robert Alford is board member of the Chicago Jazz Philharmonic. <clears throat> Jorge Perez is the executive director of the Ensemble Español. And Roger Weitz is the general manager of the Chicago Opera Theater. And um, I uh, have, you have bios in your program, so I won't go further and spend more time on this. But uh, we've invited each of them to make a comment and, a and maybe ask a question. So who want, do, did you want to start, Rob? Uh, sure. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Glad to be here. And just for context, for those of you who don't know the CJP, we are an arts organization that teaches music in uh, eight Chicago public schools, uh, specifically jazz, including jazz band. And we also have an orchestra that performs two to three times a year. Uh, it's a 55-person uh, full symphonic orchestra that plays jazz and classical mix, and it's fantastic. So if you haven't heard us, please come see us soon. Uh, we are, I, I think your analysis of where arts organizations is spot on, and we're, as a small organization of a budget of around $300,000, we're ex exactly in, and we're having that problem. And, and 
I'm, I'm struck by your desire to say, you know, make grand plans. Uh, we'd like to do that, and yet there's this concern that if we do that and then have to backtrack because for whatever reason the funding doesn't come as quickly as we'd like, what is that? What symbol does that send to funders? What symbol does that send to the community? And you know, what's your perspective on that? You know, for me, when I talk about doing five years of artistic planning in advance, which by the way I do, I do it in pencil. <laughs> 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 and what I do is I, over a period of years, I have five years to work on a project. I start to learn, is this project fundable? Is this project going to be as good as I thought it was going to be? Do I need to delay it a little bit because I don't have the resources? Um, and I start to move things around. So I'm not talking about creating a plan, a five-year artistic plan that's set in concrete. You have no flexibility. You're never going to change it. And, and I, but I do believe that if an arts organization, particularly a small arts organization, picks just one project for five years from now and says, let's really try and make this one happen five years from now, I really believe you have a much better chance of doing that than if you say, We're, let's try and do it six months or a year from now because that's our planning horizon. So I think you really do increase the odds of doing great work if you do take that time. One of the reasons why is because I think when we go to funders, and maybe Elsbeth has experienced this or maybe she hasn't, but when we go to funders, if we're only planning our art at six months or a year ahead, we go to the funder and we're so nervous at the next project that we start talking really fast about the next project and why they have to help us and how great it is. That project may not interest the funder. When I go to a funder, I talk to them and I, mostly I listen to them. I listen to what interests them. It is not that I create a project to make them happy. I don't believe in that. But after I hear the funder talk about what they like to fund, I pull from my five year, what I call menu in my head, which are the five years of projects we're talking about. And I pick the one that I think is most likely to interest that funder, one that really fits into their guidelines or fits into their giving interests. I think you're much more likely to get a gift and much more likely to get a big gift that way than if you try and sell them into something that really doesn't interest them. And so I really work that way. And this way, I have years to find the money for this special project we want to make happen. And I find which funders will fund it or which ones won't. And I also have the time to to start to investigate and research funders who we've never gotten before. I'll give you an example. Uh, l last season, um, our biggest project was a festival of Arab culture. And we felt it was very important for Americans to know more about Arab people and to understand Arab culture. I spent five years on that project. And it gave me time to research a whole new group of funders who don't normally fund the Kennedy Center. And because I took the time, I really did find the resources. I would not have found those resources if I gave myself six or eight months. So I really do think smaller organizations can do that if one has the discipline to carve out a little bit of time to really focus on what we're going to do three and four years from now, rather than what we're going to do three or four months from now. Thank you. OK. Um, we're part of the, uh, the Ensemble Español, is the uh, Spanish Dance Theater and Center for Spanish Dance and Music in the United States to have in-residence status at Northeastern Illinois University here in, in Chicago. And we're currently celebrating our, our 35th anniversary season. And I know the, um, the, the, the financial, I guess, problems of our, of our country did somewhat detour our, our 35th anniversary activities because of the reality, budget cuts, not only from the state, but from the city, and even from our own in-residence. In, in, in uh, but one of the things um, I, I just wanted to, uh, because we're on the Capacity Building Midwest program and we've had some, some wonderful employees from the Kennedy Center come and nurture our organization as far as not to forget your mission. And again, we, we, we toss back and forth, but without the money, I mean, yes, the mission, the artists, how do we keep all our artists interested in, 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 in what we're doing? And I, I must say that uh, one of the uh, gratifying events that we did th this summer was the, the opening act for Dance for Life, which is one of Chicago's biggest fundraisers that we, that we have. And we really didn't have the resources or, or money to put forth on that. Uh, but we thought, you know, it's, it's so important uh, for, for us to do this. And we went on ahead and, and did that. And, and from that, uh, we were able to get some donations to help pay the artists because it's, a, it, it's such an important um, sector and program of, of the Dance for Life has. And I must say that the, ex the exposure 
that, that we had was incredible from the MC uh, of the evening, which was Dean Richards of, of WGN Radio um, and, and, and Channel 9. And the next day, there he was talking about us for the three hours of his show. He just kept commenting, Ensemble Espanol and their bolero, they were incredible. Was that amazing? And we did cause you know, a, a stir in that everyone did give us a standing ovation for, um, for the organization as the opening number. And I, I, I think uh, it, it's just so important for, you know, as we've been listening to the Kennedy Center employees come to us, is that I guess we really can't forget our, our mission of what we do. Um, in, in these times of crisis and all these cuts that we have received, you, our educational program, I don't know how, but now I do, has actually doubled in size. We've reached out to more schools because we've reached out to partnerships after school matters program you know, we parted with them uh, for two years and we were able to reach out to, to more children. Urban Gateways also partnering with them more only because what do we do? Do we cut our programming because we just got cut from the state or under the city? And one of the things we did venture on was, was the partnership. Um, we're trying to get our board to, to further integrate that, to understand how important is the mission, as excited as our, our artists are. Um, do you have, I know you were mentioning that we've got to have the, it, it would be great to have these five-year plans, you know, to inject into our board, but what happens when it's a board that's just so stuck on, on, on the finances? And I mean, they're seeing the results of, you know, the, the, the mission and, and the outreach in, in, in these times, but what would you, what can we further inject into, I mean, money is money and finances and, and cuts or whatnot is a reality. What further work could we do to definitely get that sector of the program, the board, to understand this is, this is important to us? I'll say a few things. First of all, it's great the work you were doing. What I hope is that with this wonderful thing you did this summer, that you have the next event and the next event and the next event in your head. I believe that large organizations need to do 10 or 12 things a year that are really startling to the community. And small and mid-sized organizations need to do three or four things a year that are really amazing, like the one you did this summer. So I hope that you'll think about the next one and the next one and the next one and not, be, not only do the one you did this summer and that it isn't an accident that that happened. Does that make sense? Yes. That makes and then sense. also what I hope is that once you do something wonderful like that, not everyone will have heard the radio show that you're mentioning. And so what I would want every orchestra organization to do is to make a list of about 100 or 200 people who you think realistically could, could help give you money. Not that they do give you money, but they could give you money. But also not ridiculous people like Bill Gates. Bill Gates does not fund the arts, and certainly doesn't fund the arts outside of Seattle, so you're not gonna get any money from Bill Gates, so that's okay. But who might you get money from? And then make sure that you are emailing to them links to every radio show or, or copies of articles, so that you actually have an afterlife for having done the event. Make sure that it's not dying with the event. Make sure that that concentrated group of people who you believe could help you is getting every article, every citation from you. Go, and they'll go, wow, I'm reading about this group all the time. I'm hearing about them all the time. When you do that, first of all, make sure your board's on that list. <laughs> that helps. But also, and you won't like this part of it, I really, 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 really comb my budget to cut every single expense I can that's not artistic or marketing. Um, as, my, as I tell my staff, I squeeze every nickel till the buffalo poops. Um, <laughs> and I've never seen a budget I can't cut, um, which will shock even those of you in tiny organizations. I've cut budgets of tiny organizations because I really want to make sure the focus is on the work. And so I, once I do that, and once I show my board I'm doing that, they tend to relax a little bit, saying, OK, he's, he is responsible. He's, he understands the money, the fear. But the last thing I'll say is, you can do your five-year programming and not tell your board. You don't have to tell them about all the ideas you have for the future. You can just start working on them and seeing them happen. And believe me, if you can start bringing in a good gift for a project that you plan three years from now, the board's not going to object to that project. <laughs> they object when you only talk about the cost, not when you actually start showing them revenue. That's been my experience. 
And believe me, when you're running bankrupt organizations, the board's very nervous. My board at the Royal Opera House met every week for five hours. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and one of those hours, they, took, they each got a red pencil and a stack of every press release we were gonna issue that, that week, and they edited them in the board meeting. It didn't last very long after I got there, but that was what they did before I got there because they were so nervous. And when board members get nervous, they tend to poach. And our goal is to make them not nervous. And the kind of institutional marketing that I talked about with Ailey is something that got them not nervous. And the kind of thing you did this summer, you just have to have the next one and the next one and the next one. And they do relax. They really do relax. Mm -hmm. Roger. Thank you. For those of you who don't know, Chicago Opera Theater performs at the Harris Theater in Millennium Park. We have uh, three performances on a festival format in the spring. I also can't resist uh, using this platform to make sure everyone knows that next week is National Opera Week. <laughs> it was declared <laughs> National Opera Week by Mayor Daley. Uh, we're partnering with the City of Chicago, Department of Cultural Affairs, and also Opera America. If you follow us on Twitter, you can find um, clues about where we're going to be popping up, pop-up performances um, all over Chicago. And we'll be there with brochures. So. Um, well, I, I know we're, we're focusing on it, and I know, but it's, it's central to your message is the idea of institutional marketing. And, you know, we're so, Chicago is a fantastic city full of arts organizations from tiny theater companies and storefront to the Art Institute, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Lyric Opera. Um, there's so much competition for ticket sales. There's so much competition for funding. Um, perhaps you could talk or maybe draw upon stories from your tour institutional marketing, examples of great ways that really small organizations without the huge budgets to pump out the, the posters. What, do you have examples of amazing sure. things you came across? And I appreciate that if you're running a really small organization, the example from Alvin Ailey about all we did can be really frustrating because you're going, well, we can't do a presidential gala, we can't get on Donahue, why would any, you know, how is it relevant to me? I really do believe institutional marketing can happen for any sized organization especially smaller organizations. Let me give you an example, one example that I, that I was involved with. It was when I ran my little Kansas City Ballet, um, which was three of us in a room um, in Kansas City, Missouri. And we had a tagline at Kansas City Ballet, the company that can't make payroll. Because um, <laughs> every few weeks we would call up around town, do you have $200 or $400 to help us pay the dancers this time? And, and it was, obviously, I came into this organization, I was the fifth CEO in five years, and it was clear we could not survive that way. It actually was a really good company. It was a really good company, but the, but the community had, didn't value it at all. They didn't know what they had there. And so we had to create some fame with very little resource. So what did we do there? Well, I put on my board the anchor of the Live at Five News from the local NBC affiliate. And his board contribution was four times a year to put us on his show. So we automatically had a really nice, every quarter we had, it wasn't me talking, it was artists, guest choreographers or dancers, et cetera, talking. Number two, we found a really great TV show called Good Morning Kansas City. No one wanted to go on it because you had to get up at 3.30 in the morning to go on Good Morning <laughs> Kansas City. Um, but I was willing to do that. And I did it three times a year and they gave me 15 minutes each time. And who's watching Good Morning Kansas City was the business community getting ready for work. And so I had 15 minutes three times a year to go on and talk about all the things we were doing. And I talked about more from an in, from a institutional perspective rather than from the artistic perspective for that audience. Then, and most importantly, I would say, my artistic director, Todd Bolander, a fantastic dancer and choreographer, um, had, had worked with Balanchine, had created the work Royal Phlegmatic, for those of you who know Four Temptations, he was the original. He rediscovered a work by Balanchine that hadn't been done in 25 years. We, we did it at the Kansas City Ballet. Dance press came from all over the country to cover this. And the people in Kansas City couldn't believe, why do people in New York care about what's going on in our little ballet company? Your art, if it's interesting enough, if it's important enough, can really be your best institutional marketing, even if you're a very small organization. And then what else we did? This is something that anyone can do. Um, in Kansas City, it's a landlocked community. Um, there's not a lot of places to go in Kansas City, so people's hobby is to buy each other's house and redecorate it. <laughs> and, 
one of my board members had bought someone else's house and redecorated, and everyone in the community wanted to see that house. So I asked him, would he give a cocktail party for about 40 of the leading citizens of, of Kansas City, which he did. And they came to see the house. They didn't come for anything because of the Kansas City Ballet. But in the middle of the cocktail party, I made a 20-minute presentation about our strategic plan, all the things we were going to do to change this impression of the company that can't make payroll. And I gave everyone who came a copy of our strategic plan. And it did more to change the impression of Kansas City in our community than anything else we could have done. And that does not require to be a fancy, big organization to do. Anyone can do that. And then we were the first Kansas City organization to be invited to perform in New York City. And this, again, was really big news in Kansas City. We did all of these things in a 10-month period. And in 10 months, we paid off the entire deficit of the organization. This is not a famous organization. It would never get on a presidential gala. It would never get on the Donahue Show. It would never get on the Smithsonian. But those kinds of activities can be done at any level. And when we do them, our families get interested. Our boards get excited. They stop worrying about the money just a little bit. And we all can do that. Find a museum or a library or a community center that will house an exhibition about your history and your contributions to your community. It's the best thing to bring donors to. Easily done. Find a larger organization that you can work with that has more prestige than you do, but that you can do a joint venture with. An example, at Ailey, across the street from us was a big university in New York called Fordham University. We made a joint venture with Fordham University where their students could fulfill their physical education requirements by coming to our school, which gave us a lot of revenue, and our dancers could take academic credits at Fordham. We both benefited. But we also benefited from a fundraising and marketing perspective. Fordham University, to this day, has a page in their catalog that they send out to prospective freshmen saying, come to Fordham, and you can dance with Alvin Ailey, which is not exactly true, but it was close enough. <laughs> <laughs> and we at Ailey, to this day, have a Fordham night every year in our New York season where their board members and their donors come to see an Ailey performance. It gives us access to a new group. Any organization can find that, and particularly those of us who represent specific communities. The larger institutions need us because we can bring them people from a specific community. And so we need, we can, we can really benefit a larger organization. So find one, find a project where you be, can both benefit. And, 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 and so I believe this is work that can be done by any sized organization. I don't believe this is limited to big, fancy institutions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to start taking questions uh, from people in the audience. There's a mic on each side. I'm going to start off, and then you're going to be uh, first after that. And my question is, um, uh, I, I understand your rationale about how getting board members involved with the mission. How does that fit with a give or get <coughs> policy? I want the majority of my, I want everyone on my board to do something important and measurable for my institution. I don't believe in tokenism. I don't want one person on my board because they're black. And, and you're on my board because you're black. It's not good enough. If they're going to help me get access to the black community and bring me into the African American community and build a relationship, fantastic. But I don't believe in tokenism. I don't believe in someone being on the board just because they're an artist and they once were a great artist, and now we're going to have them on the board. I want people on my board who are going to be helpful. To many of my board, that will be partly a, a, a help financially. But there are other ways to be helpful, like the board member in Kansas City who got us on his TV show four times a year. I think this has to be enlightened give or get. I think this has to be co a conversation. I believe the nominating committees, and the, which I prefer to call governance committees, because I think they need to do more than have cocktail parties with prospective board members. I, I want my, my, board, my, nom my governance committee to really think this through. What do we need? What skills do we need? And depending on the, the placement of the organization on the life cycle, that's going to tell me what kind of board members I need. When, it, when an organization's tiny and started, typically started by someone with an artistic vision, then we need in our board people who are going to be staff people, who are going to help us do the marketing. We may have no staff, and we need help with, and we don't, give or get is less important at that point. We need someone who knows how to do our bookkeeping. We need someone who knows how to do some marketing. But as the organization grows and changes, then we need our board to be a little bit different. We don't need the staff help so much. We need them to be more givers and getters. 
And so then the, it changes. And what I find is really a problem in so many organizations in this country is the organization has matured and the board has not matured with the organization. When I got to Alvin Ailey, half of my 36 board members had been on the board for 35 years. We had wonderful people who had sewn the original costumes for Revelations and driven the dancers to the first performances. <laughs> and they were wonderful people and I wanted to keep them in my family, but they didn't belong in my board anymore because we needed different things. So boards have to start to evaluate and it has to be enlightened rather than we have a rule and that's the rule and that better be the way it is. You need to think through where are we now, where are we gonna be in five years, how do we change our board? Thank you. Can I, and can I just say one more thing? Mm. Particularly for arts organizations of color, this is an issue. So many arts organizations of color have boards that really look like community service organizations and not the boards that are really gonna help them get to the <coughs> next level. And one of my biggest concerns for the arts ecology of this country is we have one performing arts organization in this country with a, of color with a budget of more than $10 million, exactly one. And that is outrageous but it comes in large measure because we haven't really attended to the board structures of organizations of color well enough. Quick comment here. Relevant comment then. Uh, we are an organization that is predominantly minority and one of our challenges is you know, getting access to the board members who can you know, sort of give us access to the places in Chicago where we can really begin getting more funding. And you know, my question to you is, are you saying using in, you should use institutional marketing to capture the, the attention of, of that? It group certainly of board helps, members? but there's more specific, easier things to do. Go to every big corporation and say, who's an up and you don't want the CEO, who's an up and coming executive who could serve on my board? So many corporations want their young executives to be involved in the community in some way. This is, even if the company doesn't give you money, say, do you have someone? who could serve on our board, who's really a wonderful, talented young person who's on the way up. And you know what, you'll get the company money that way. <laughs> but you'll also start to find some better, more potent board members than maybe you're getting, because we tend to be a little cliquish in our boards. You know, our boards, our nominating committees tends to be a little group of friends and they look for their friends. And we tend not to reach far enough away. This is one way to start to break that, that boundary and start to bring new people onto our boards. Really Thank crucial. You. Thanks Sorry. for your patience. Would you introduce yourself before you ask your question or make your comment? Uh, Gary Johnson, Chicago History Museum. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the members of our organization who are actually doing the great art. Um, do you think that they should be brought in a little bit on some of these administrative fundamentals? Should they know something about institutional marketing? Should they know something about fundraising, something about governance? Absolutely, not just even something. I bring my artists into all of my planning discussions. When we do a strategic plan, it is not the administrator sitting in a little room. The artists are right there with us. When we do institutional marketing campaigns, let's take the Ailey campaign. My artists were involved every step of the way. And if you talk to this day to the dancers of Ailey who were there back then, 20 years ago, they'll tell you about all the things they did as part of this effort. It's crucial, and you know what? I find artists love institutional marketing activities because they love it when people start to think differently of the organization. They love it when they're, when they're respected in a different kind of way. And frankly, I have a belief that if every arts organization did great institutional marketing, the whole field of the arts would be perceived differently. And, and I take my lead, I'm sorry to say it, from sports. The sports world does it so much better than we do it. I mean. I'm sorry, I'm Chicago. I see what's going on with, with the basketball season starting and, mm -hmm. and the Bulls, and I see what's going on with the Bears. And you, there's so much institutional marketing that's done so well by sports leagues. And we can learn from that. And I believe if we do it, we will have a much happier role in our society. And yes, artists have to be part of this process. I think one thing I try and mean by this cycle is that you know, I tend to see a lot of arts organizations having silos. The artists are over here and the marketers over here and everyone always hates the fundraisers because they dress the nicest and go to nice lunches and, you know. <laughs> and, and what I'm trying to imply here is that we're really all part of one organism. We all have a role and we have to hand off really well and talk to each other really well, otherwise this cycle doesn't happen. Thank you. Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Boone with the Joyce Foundation. Hi, Michael, Michelle, and you? thank you so much for all that you've you done. Help. It's a little dark over there. Um, 
I'm curious, when you did your 50 city tour, I, I have a number of my art funder colleagues in the audience. Um, what was the reaction from the funders um, when you did your tour to a lot of what you talked about? Uh, because there's, I think, a tendency, um, certainly not by me, but maybe by some of the other colleagues, to maybe have a different view about um, what a healthy arts organization um, looks like. And in fact, we just had a national arts conference here in Chicago last week that has a big initiative around capitalization and starting a conversation with funders nationally about encouraging grantees to have cash reserves and endowments and a better financial picture. And so if, if one side of the table is still being um, concerned and focused on you know, the financial page, and then you're having these conversations with arts organizations about focus on the art, focus on the art, how do we bring the two together? And do you ever have conversations with groups of funders in the ways that you're doing now with um, arts organizations? It's how do great, we get all on the same page? It's a great question. And because I had such a small amount of time, I didn't really talk fully. I completely believe in strong financial health and stability. And I completely love it to have an endowment. And I love to have a cash reserve. But I don't believe it makes health to have a cash reserve and to have it by starving the art. And that's what I say. And I did have funders all over the country. And in some cases, I had groups of funders who got together. And we had special sessions, for example, in Seattle. We did that in Los Angeles. We did that. And, and I would say this to them. I would say, as funders, I believe, and, I'm, and I sound arrogant when I say this, particularly to people who fund me, but as funders, I really believe it's important to get an organization that has a, an ability to consistently replenish a cash reserve and to, and to really benefit from endowment rather than where the endowment itself is the goal or the cash reserve itself is the goal. And what I spent a lot of time with funders on the tour, frankly, talking about was how they could help to encourage arts organizations to really build individual donor bases, which I believe makes an arts organization much healthier than over-relying on one or two or three major foundations and maybe a government grant in a location. Because, and this is particularly true of organizations of color or avant-garde organizations or rural organizations who depend so much on foundations and government grants, which are the most cyclical givers. When the economy goes south, they give less. And I really believe that if we can build our base of individual givers, and I believe we can do that, that we, can, that we can have a healthier arts ecology. And I believe funders can lead the way by giving challenge grants that help arts organizations and encourage them and almost force them to start to build the number of donors that they have. So I would talk about that. I would talk about a healthy financial situation. But I don't think that you get a healthy financial situation by having a one-time infusion of endowment or the establishment of a one-time cash reserve I believe the way you keep it so that you keep your endowment as endowment and keep your cash flow, your cash reserve there is by having this cycle humming so that you're constantly generating more and more revenue. And I would show them, I'd show them the organizations that I thought were success, that had been successful in their community. And almost always this cycle was humming beautifully. I just and I'm gonna to cheat and ask one more question before I have to climb back over um, people in my row. Um, any thoughts and impressions about what's happening with individual artists as a part of your 50 city tour? Individual artists really, really are struggling. Um, I would say it's the part of the arts ecology that has been the most decimated. And so many funders have, have left that. So many government funders have left that, um, that arena. And it's something that um, we really need to, to look at. The, I'll, I'll tell you one good story about individual artists. The most exciting arts project I saw in my year, I have to say, was not in Chicago or Washington or New York or Los Angeles or Houston. It was in the little town of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Not what you'd probably list as one of the top 10 art cities of America. But one young man said, I'm tired of everyone talking about the recession in my state of Michigan and the death of the auto industry. And he created an or a project called Art Prize. And what Art Prize is, many of you are, know what it is, Art Prize, he invited to Grand Rapids any individual artist, visual artist, who wanted to show their work. And he went to every building, every bank, every government agency, said, can I have the lobby of your building to show this work? 
and he went to the city and said, can we use the outdoor spaces? And 1,500 visual artists from all over the world came to Grand Rapids last summer. This is the summer of nine. It happened again now, but summer of nine, or fall of nine, I guess it was, came to Grand Rapids and showed their work from the smallest works on paper to the hugest outdoor sculptures. And he did something else very smart. He involved the public. He built his family immediately. He created a little computer program. Anybody could vote, could register, and could vote for their favorite work of art. And they gave a prize to the winner. It was a very inexpensive project because the artists came, the art came, they, had a, they got the space donated, and he did have to give the prize and write this little program and do some marketing. And the New York Times wrote about it. The Chicago Tribune wrote about it. The Wall Street Journal wrote about it. 35,000 people registered to vote. Every hotel was filled in Grand Rapids for those two weeks. Every restaurant was filled. You walked around Grand Rapids. I was lucky enough to be in my tour during this. Everyone was talking about contemporary visual arts. I mean, who would have thought that? <laughs> <laughs> and so there are ways to involve, I believe, in very creative, wonderful ways, individual artists. It takes creativity, imagination, and not surprisingly, because his project got so much visibility, his institutional marketing was so strong that this year there were 30 funders lined up to fund him, and the project got even bigger, and it's going to keep growing. So I believe there's things we can do working together, working with individual artists, but the project has to be exciting and vibrant and involve the community. Okay, we're good. We have three people waiting to make comments, and then we're going to go upstairs and continue over drinks. So, Roger? I just wanted to make a comment back when you were answering the question from the Joyce Foundation about the tension of funding. And it's just something that, that you once said that it really stuck with me, and I think it takes a lot of courage to, to repeat. It's that there's the thin line between organizations that are healthy and sick. Very, very thin line. Sick organizations can get healthy um, not in such a long period of time, but healthy organizations can get sick really, really fast. And you know, particularly in recession, when funders have to make difficult choices, they have less to give, and they're saying, do I give to this one, or do I give to this one? The organizations that are talking about really interesting work are the ones that are going to get cut last. And so for me, that's always been how I run my organization. I want my organization to be cut last, so I better have that next exciting project up my sleeve, or I'm in danger of being on the cut list. Okay, I'm Justine Nagan from Cartemquin Films, and we're a 44-year-old media arts organization here in Chicago that does social issue documentaries. Great. And I, a lot of what you were saying really resonated with me. Um, for the last five years, we've been really focusing on um, building capacity, um, supported in large part by the MacArthur Fund Foundation. And a big part of that has been around institutional marketing. Um, and right. we have a big problem in that uh, 15 years ago, we made the film Hoop Dreams. Amazing film. We love it. A lot of people love it. Um, we've made 39 other films, and <laughs> they've won Peabody's, you know, they've gone on, you know, thousands and thousands of people have seen these other films, but most people know us for Hoop Dreams, and typically I think of that almost as a weakness and a stumbling block, and as you were speaking, I was um, thinking it might actually be turned into a strength, and, and so my question for you, I guess, is do you have any advice in how to better utilize the power of Hoop Dreams in our institutional marketing instead of seeing it as a stumbling block? It, it, it takes me a while to think of a good institutional marketing program. I can't do it on my feet. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to think about that and get back to you, because it's a really interesting problem. But I would love, what's, what strikes me right away is what can you do that uses the popularity of Hoop Dreams to put, to put a spotlight on the new things you're doing and the, more, and the more contemporary work you're doing, rather than just talk about Hoop Dreams. I see this a lot with organizations. Um, I've been trying to help an organization in New York called the Harlem School of the Arts. It's a wonderful, wonderful school that's been around for about 50 years, um, training children in Harlem in, in the arts. It's fantastic. It's almost bankrupt. And one of my problems with them is all they ever talk about is their wonderful founder, Dorothy Maynard, and how great she was. Well, Dorothy Maynard, unfortunately, is dead. And she's no longer there. And to only talk about her all the time, I think, is a problem. And I think, you know, I, I think one's going to have to put a real concerted effort to put that spotlight on the new, make the new glorious, but put the spotlight in the new and not always go back to saying, we're the hoop dreams people, we're the hoop dreams people, we're the hoop dreams people. Exactly how you would do that, I would like to spend at least an hour thinking about. I'm sure they'd welcome your spending an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes, last comment here. 
Hi, I'm Paul Botts with the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation here in Chicago. And um, many people in this room know, but you may not, that the Grand Rapids idea was such a good one that folks here in Chicago have, um, are picking up on it and doing Great. its own version. You have till 8 p.m. tonight to vote. You can go down into the loop and see a whole bunch of contemporary art and like Fantastic. That. So it's a great idea and it's, it's going to spread. My question, because I attended the same national conference that Michelle Boone mentioned, and uh, so and maybe this would be sort of a summary question for you. There's at least two broad macro trends or realities that were much discussed at that conference and, and other conferences this year and informed by a lot of good data. One, of course, is the recession, obviously. Economic context completely different than two, three, five, or ten years ago. Uh, and another, which is specific to the arts, which there's just a wave of emerging data really building, is the concept that in this country we are living through the middle of a, uh, a great explosion in personal, individual, creative practice, is mm -hmm. usually the phrase that's used. And, you know, in Chicago, our poster child is that while lots of organizations are struggling, the Old Town School of Folk Music literally can't build fast enough to meet the demand for adult classes, not people trying to become professional musicians, but just for the sake of it. So my question to you is, if I look at your chart there and your overall message, so it's really sort of two questions. One, would you say, based on the recession realities, would this picture, your message, your, your description, would it be different in 2005 or 1999 or whatever compared to the recessionary reality we're living in now? And then secondarily, is this, this, this broad social change, is it its influence? Do you think it's likely to change your description, your understanding of how arts organizations can best go about their business? I don't think this model depends upon the nature of the economy. Oh, okay. I believe the notion of getting people excited and involved and doing good work, there is still money out there to give to the arts. Arts funding, I think last year fell 6% nationally. I believe that's the number. It didn't fall 92%. Um, there's still money out there to be raised. And the organizations that raise it, I think, are the ones that are going to be the ones that are doing interesting work and extremely visible. And, and so I believe the recession only heightens my concern that we follow this kind of model, that we don't ignore the art, that we don't think the only thing we should do is to be as conventional and boring. I've seen so many opera companies who only say they want to do Carmen now and only do La Boheme and whose boards are encouraging that thing will sell more tickets. And you know what's happening? They're selling less tickets because they're t people are tired of La Boheme and Carmen only as a steady diet. <laughs> and when I go around the country, and one of the things I asked, because I had sort of a meet and greet for an hour, I asked the same question of everyone. I said, what was the greatest arts experience of your life? And you know what was interesting? When, when you ask audiences, what work do they want to hear of the symphony? They'll say Beethoven's Fifth. Or what ballet do they want to see? They'll say Swan Lake. Or what theater piece you want to see? They'll say Phantom of the Opera or Cats. But when you actually go to someone and say, what was the greatest experience of your life in the arts? No one said Beethoven's Fifth. No one said Swan Lake. And no one said Cats. Not that those aren't wonderful works, but they all said it was something unusual, something that surprised them, something they didn't know they were going to love. And, and I always recall the story of the Edsel. Some of us are old enough to remember what the Edsel was. The Edsel was a car designed by Ford. It was the first automobile designed by focus groups. <laughs> Ford Motor had all these focus groups. And they got lots of people together saying, which hubcap do you like the best? And which steering wheel do you like the best? And they got all this information. They took the, what everyone loved the most, and they created a car that no one in America bought. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think we have to remember that we're leading, not following, that we only fulfill our role in society if we have something to say. If we have nothing to say, we shouldn't be in the arts. But if we have something to say, we're leading. And we need to keep our focus on that and not be so scared about money that we're only hiding. And then with respect to the change in the way people work, absolutely, what interests and excites our family changes. That doesn't mean we need to change our mission, but we need to, but our mission is not how we do stuff. The mission is what we want to accomplish. And there are new ways to accomplish things. You know, I'm deeply involved in one of my missions of my organization is arts education. And the way we deliver arts education today is completely different than the way we, we created, we delivered it 30 years ago. So I think, yes, we need, different we need different technologies. We need to think about what our audience is and how they're going to interact with us differently. 
but it doesn't mean that we should ignore our base mission and think we have to change everything we want to be simply because the world is changing. I, I, and I, I'll finish by saying I, I learned this from a wonderful man named Richard Foreman. Some of you may know Richard Foreman. He's the leading absurdist playwright in America. I've seen many of his plays. I don't understand a word of what he's talking about. I'm not <laughs> smart enough. And Richard Foreman plays in a tiny little theater with 99 seats at St. Mark's Church in New York City. And I went to him, and he's, and he's a foundation darling because foundations love him because he's such a genius and he creates such important work. And he's got lots of money stored up in his balance sheet. And I said to Mr. Foreman, you've got all this money. Why do you perform in this little church? And he said, you know what, Michael? I know there are only 99 people a night who want to see what I do. <laughs> and he said, if I go into a big theater, I can afford it, but I'll do two things. One is I'm going to change my art to please more people, or, which I don't want to do, or I'm going to spend all my time trying to trick people into coming into my theater, which I don't want to do either. And so one thing I learned from that was your mission really does rule. And what you're trying to accomplish is precious. It's why we're in this field. And we have to be realistic what that means. It might mean we just have 99 people a night. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think what's driven a lot of arts organizations is the notion that bigger is better. And the bigger we get, and the bigger the building, and the more we have, the better we're doing. And I think we've got to go back to really exploring our missions very deeply and saying, what really are we trying to accomplish? How are we going to do that? What are the realities of today? Which means, how do we deliver what we do in a way that, is, that, that people are going to want to accept? But we can't just do things to build the balance sheet. Otherwise, we're really going to lose why we're in this business. And we're going to lose the arts if we do that. That's a great thought to carry with us up to the, which floor? Ninth, Ninth floor, uh, where we're going to have refreshments and continued conversation. Thank you so much, Michael Kaiser. Thank you.